Hey, Northman, we're going to do something a little bit different. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to yell at you. We're going to do something a little bit different here to start off this morning. Would you, would you stand to your feet with me? And I want, to, I want to tell you why we're standing on our feet. We're going to honor uh, this gift that God has blessed us with. His name is Chris Wallace today. He's a friend of our church. Um, yeah, give it up for Chris. He, uh, he uh, has been faithfully a world outreach for many, many years. He's currently the administrative pastor uh, when you look around our church, his fingerprints are all over it because he's developed people like Jason, like me, and so many others in our church. So, hey, can you help me welcome our good friend, Pastor Chris Wallace? First of all, please be seated. You guys are making me a nervous wreck. Secondly, do not go blaming me for how you and Jason turned out. North Bend, what is up? Are y'all doing all right this morning? It is such a privilege for me to be here and just to be able to speak God's word into and over your life. Um, I know that you guys are missing Pastor Jason and Holly and that wonderful family. They are such an incredible blessing to the family of God. Amen. They... They are a blessing to me. Uh, I had the chance to marry them, uh, which was pretty amazing. Uh, absolutely to this day, one of my favorite, favorite weddings, even though when I walked out of that place, I was soaking wet. It was so, I'm sure you've heard this story before, it was a torrential downpour during an outdoor wedding. Ruined a suit. Pastor Jason, you still owe me a suit. Not that I'm bitter. It's been about 20 years or so, but... Uh, you know, how many of you know that God's creation is absolutely glorious? It is phenomenal. Although I will confess to you that there are times I question God's creation. One of those times is I was trying to play 18 holes yesterday. And when I say trying to play 18 holes, I truly mean trying to play 18 holes. I was going for my best score ever, about to break under 120. And... <laughs> I'm cruising down 18 in the cart because it was hot yesterday and there's no way I was walking 18 holes. I'm cruising in the cart and a bug flies right in my eye. At that very moment, I was not blessing the creation of God. I was angry. I was mad. I woke up this morning. My eye was still swollen. I'm like, what in the world? Uh, and I, I shot a nine on that hole which was normally better than my double par that I average. Uh, so, you know, maybe the bug helped me a little bit. It didn't take the slice out of it. Uh, but every once in a while, I hear a story of God's creation that is just absolutely mind-blowing. Have you ever heard those stories that you are just, you just sit there and are like, wow, how does this even happen? I heard a story recently about a man who didn't believe in God. But he was walking through the woods, and, and he was admiring all of the stuff that was around him, all the accidents that evolution had created. He said to himself, wow, what majestic trees and, and what powerful rivers, what, what beautiful animals there are all around me. When all of a sudden he heard a rustling behind him in one of the streams, and he turned around and he saw, much to his chagrin, he saw a seven-foot grizzly bear, and he knew something bad was about to happen. That grizzly bear put its paws down and began to run toward him as fast as it could, and, and the man, he, he tries his best to escape, and he takes off running uh, as fast as he possibly could. He looks back, though, and the grizzly bear, how many of you know that grizzly bears are, are pretty quick? I mean, I don't know, but if any of you ever see me running downtown Mason, that's probably because a bear is chasing me, not because I'm running to begin in shape. This man, he began running for his life, and, and as the grizzly bear was closing in, somehow he found that extra gear, and he was so afraid that he began to cry, and, and he, began, he was running, and tears were flowing, and he looked back one last time, and then he tripped over a log. And he tries to get up, he, he tries his best, but he hears the grizzly bear breathing. As he rolls over, the grizzly bear is poised right over top of him. The left paw down, grabbing him, the right paw about to strike. 
And this man in that moment, how many of you know that in that moment of panic, almost everybody will cry out to God? In that moment of panic, he said, God, help me. Everything stops. The wind stops blowing through the trees. The, the river stops running. There's, there's no birds singing. Time stopped and a light shone down from heaven as the story goes. And God comes and he says, what is it? Would you give your life to me? The atheist, he, he speaks back to the light and he's being honest and as humble as he can. And he says, no God, after all of this time, I would feel like a hypocrite if I would only give my life to you in this moment when my life is in danger. But if you could make this grizzly bear a Christian, I would appreciate it. <laughs> At that moment, the Lord said, so be it. The rivers began to run. The birds began to chirp. The wind was rustling through the trees once again. That grizzly bear put down his right paw and brought it together with his left and said, God, for this meal I'm about to receive, I thank you. <laughs> the devil would have us as humanity believe that we're nothing more than highly evolved mammals, mammals that by the luck of the draw or flip of the coin that we became more advanced than any other of the 8.7 million species in this world today. Most science would have us believe in cosmic chance and mythology would have us believe in divine chance, neither of which is true. The truth is, is that we are God's special creation. We as humanity are the apple of God's eye. We have orchestrated purpose. We are loved emphatically by the creator of the universe, the grand composer of all creation. I am so thankful for creation because of three words that the Bible uses to describe the world that we live in prior to God's creative power. The Bible says that the world was formless, it was empty, and it was dark. And can I tell you, before the Word of God spoke into my life, that was my life. It seemed to take no shape. It seemed to have no substance. It seemed to be empty, and it seemed to be dark. But the moment the creative power of God's Word begins speaking into creation, things begin to change. God's Word changes lives as he begins to speak things begin to come into existence on day one he spoke and there was light and there was night on day two the atmosphere as we know it was formed on day three dry land and oceans and and vegetation and trees of all kinds on day four the sun the moon the stars were all formed. Day five, the fish and the birds. Day six, animals. And for everything that was created on days one through five, it seemed as if God used the same arrangement, the same composition, the same chord progression, if you will, when he said, God said it, it was so, and it was good. Day two, God said it, it was so, and it was good. Day three, God said it, it was so, and it was good. God said it, it was so, and it was good. God said it, it was so, and it was good. There's an unmistakable rhythm in God's word. It was the sound of creation in concert. However, when it came to the day six symphony, God was about to switch things up. He was, he was about to shift the rhythm. He was about to add an extra beat, a couple of extra notes when he came to humanity. He was about to create the apple of his eye and he cared so much for this new creation that he added a little bit extra. Look at your neighbor and say, a little extra. 
Today I'd like to preach to you the message that I've entitled, The Crescendo of Creation. And as we read God's Word together, I want you to pay, to pay special attention to some of the language that is in the creation story of, of mankind. I want you to see if you can pick up on the different notes that are included in the Scripture as we attempt to find our rhythm. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 28, and then I'm just going to merge right into Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. It says this, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Genesis 2-7. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. Will you join me as we pray? Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is your word that creates. It is your word that changes. So Father, we thank you for being with us this morning. Holy Spirit, have your will and your way. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. 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 There are four different notes that God includes in the creation of humanity that I would like to bring to our attention in here this morning. Note number one, it was a different word. It was a different kind of word. That rhythm switched up when it came to all of, all of other creation and hum humankind. It was different. He said, let us make man. Now, did you catch that? In no, nowhere else, in days one through five, did God have conversation with anybody. He simply exercised dominion. He spoke two things, and it was done. But because mankind is the creation that, that God had set in his heart, because we are the apple of God's own eye, he switched from that dominion speaking... To conversation. I can see Jesus and the Holy Spirit sitting in the heavens with the Father as he began to speak and he, he thinks about us and he says, let us make man. Now make no mistake about it, the Word of God has always had creative power. But in this instance, it was, it was something special forming. It was a different Note, the Word of God is so powerful that once it goes forth, it can never be brought back. Do you realize that? That once it goes forth in the world, it never stops creating. In fact, do you realize that, that studies and science and the Hubble telescope will even back up that the universe is still expanding to this moment? You realize that? And it's not slowing down, but it's going faster than you could ever dream or imagine. Still expanding. Why? Because once a word is spoken from God, it is all-powerful and can never be changed or taken back. The universe is still expanding. At one time, they thought that, that when it comes to the human brain, that we reach a certain age and our brain just stops developing. That's not true. We reach a certain age and then we tend to get settled. Settled's a good word. I mean, that's a nice, friendly word. We tend to get settled, so, so we stop we stop learning, we, we stop reading, we, we, become, we become just satisfied with where we're at. But science now tells us that as long as we, stop, we uh, keep feeding this thing called the brain, 
it will continue to grow and expand. Ladies, what I'm telling you is there's hope for your husband. There's hope. Nikki has put up with a whole lot, but, but there's hope. There's hope. Without God's word in our life, we will always be without direction. We will, we will always feel empty. We will always feel darkness around us. Why? Because we were created with the word of God. And if the word of God is not continually being poured into us, that is the life source from the very beginning of creation. You see, it was a different word. It was conversation. And, and that proves to me that God is not intimidated by any conversation that we may want to have with him. How many of you are, are brave enough to say, you know what, I've had some conversations with God about some things that I wasn't quite sure about. God welcomes those conversations. Why, why would, he, would he have that conversation and say, let us make man in our image? It was as an example for how he wants our relationship to be with him. A relationship not simply based on dominion. God said it, it was so, and it was good. But a relationship based on, hey, let's talk for a little bit. Let's, let's have some conversation. Let's, let's not only you speak to me, but, but take time to listen. Because God inclines his ear to creation, to, to humanity. He inclines his ear unto us. That says that God doesn't just want to speak into our life. He wants us to speak to him. You see, it was a different kind of word. Note number two. It was a different type of idea. Look at your neighbor and say, Imago Dei. Y'all, you weren't with me on that. You, you were like, Imago Dei. What is he saying? No. Look at your neighbor and say, Imago Dei. It was a different idea. It was, it, Imago Dei means created in the image of God. You realize that 8.7 billion species or whatever that number is, they were not created in the image of God. However, when it came to people, when it came to us, we were created in God's image. And call me crazy, but I believe that if we were created in God's image, then we should at least begin to resemble the one who created us. We see the attributes of God at work in the world. And I'm telling you that if I am created in his image, if we are created in his image, I want to take on some of those attributes, some of those characteristics of the one who created me. But as humans, we have a tendency to kind of downshift. We, we stop living out of imagination and we start living out of our history. We stop dreaming about what could be and start remembering Man, it sure was nice. We stop creating better cultures and start complaining about existing ones. But I never, I never see God do that. I, and can I tell you, and this is a side note, I won't go off on a rabbit trail because 1030 is coming in, but can I just share with you that there has never been a better culture introduced by tearing down an older one. Better cultures are introduced by building a better culture. And that is what we are called to do as the church. Listen, I am telling you, the world sure does know what we stand against. Gosh, we let them know. We let them have it. But I want to be a part of the church that is Imago Dei, created in God's image, and not being the one just saying everything we're against. But listen, I want people to know this is what we're for. We are for people. We are for the broken. We are for building a better culture, showing a better way, showing God's way. These are the things the church should be for. But Imago Dei, it's a different idea. It, it, it goes against what the world has to say. Do you realize 
that anything that is created in the image of God will be polar opposite from what the world says. We were created in his image. And because we were created in his image, I believe that we are called to experiment courageously. I don't believe for a second that we should reach a point in our faith where we are bored. Although I will admit to you that I have been there. I have been there and I was like, God, is this it? Is this it? We, we come to church on a, on a Sunday morning and, and we attend midweek and we worship and we hear a word and then we go throughout our week and then it's just like a revolving door where it keeps going in and out, in and out, in and out. No. God is a creative God and we are called to experiment courageously. We are called to love boldly, almost recklessly. 1 John 4, 8 says that God is love. And I'm telling you that if we were made in his image, imago Dei, then we are called to love, first of all, him and to love each other. We are, care, we are called to live out of a place of love. That we don't live out of fear. We don't live out of doubt. We don't live out of shame. We were created in God's image. And if God is love, then the only place I want to live from is out of that place of love. I believe that we are called to explore in God's image. You, you notice that, that in Genesis chapter 1, the, the Holy Spirit was hovering over the earth, exploring. God has a spirit of exploration. Adam and Eve, as much as we would like to think, gosh, they really screwed things up. If it wasn't for them, we'd still be in the Garden of Eden. Do you realize that God never called Adam and Eve to stay in the Garden? Uh Uh-oh. You didn't hear that in Sunday school. God said, fill the earth and subdue it. But we can see that Adam and Eve, we don't see where they had any plans of going anywhere else from the Garden of Eden. That All they had their eye on was the honey crisp apple in the middle. I know, some of you theologians saying, now pastor, it didn't say it was an apple. I like to envision a honey crisp. Would you humor me? We are called to explore. We are called to go outside of the boundaries that this world has placed us in. We were created for adventure. But so many times in our Christian faith, in our Christian journey, we have settled for for just this little boxed up version of Christianity. And what I am learning more and more is that that life with God truly doesn't begin until we climb up on top of that box and we get a view of things all around us, the places where God wants us to go, the places where God wants us to explore, the people and the methods that God wants us to reach. It's an adventure, and that's exactly what Christianity should be. If I am created in the image of God, then I must have been created with some responsibility. I believe that if I'm created in the image of God, if we are are to be imago Dei, like we are called to be, then we should be caring for our families. We should be taking care of each other. We should be caring for the creation that God has entrusted us with. Ah, Chris, are you one of them tree huggers? I'm just saying we've been given some responsibility, and I think that if we don't begin to take that responsibility serious as the church, then that's going to be an immediate turnoff for generations that are coming up behind us, just watching us flippantly destroy the creation that God has made. So yes, I believe that we should care for the earth. I think we should be fruitful, that that we should reproduce. Somebody say amen. Amen. That we should fill the earth. That we should take charge. But can we take charge in a different kind of way? Can we take charge with the thought in mind that, 
that God spoke a, a different word. And he said, let us make man. Where we, where we take charge with conversation. And not as if we are, we are some despot dictator telling everybody what they need to be doing. Can we just have some conversation? Can we talk about things a little bit? The third different note that I see when it comes to creation is this. It's a different way. We were formed from dust. 5,416 different species of mammals. And here we are. We were the only ones formed. Let me explain this to you. All of other creation was spoken into existence. We like to have this Sunday school visual, visual that's going on where God, you know, he forms a tree with some Play-Doh-like substances. He, he forms some birds and they float. No, 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 no. All of those things were simply spoken to. The only thing the Bible talks about that was formed is humanity. God was hands on when he created each and every single one of us. So don't believe for a second that God just puts you on this earth and then he's a hands-off God. That whatever happens just happens to you. God has formed you with unique purpose and intent and don't ever forget it. He molded you, he crafted you, he shaped you. And like a master potter, he still desires to shape each and every single one of our lives. Number four, are you ready for it? It was a different source. It was a different source of life. All of other creation, God, God said it. There it was, and it was good. But with man, he formed us, and then he did something amazing. It, it's, we are not just alive because of the word. We are alive because of the breath. All, everything else was created by the word only. But God wanted to put a piece of himself into each and every single one of us. So when you were created, whew, he breathed. Oxygen enables us to be alive. But it's the breath of God that gives us life and life more abundantly. If we need anything in this world, we need the breath of God. Before I was saved, I thought that I was really living life. Before I was introduced to Jesus Christ, I thought that life couldn't be any better than the way I was living. It was only when I met the one who created me that I realized that I wasn't living at all. I was, I was simply existing. And when I think about the breath of life, I, I think about how important that aspect must be. And then I think about Satan in the garden. And I think about the venom of, of sin that he injected into this world. But you see, the venom didn't work. <laughs> oh, it worked for a moment, but, but in that very moment, God comes down and says, Hey, you may have won this little battle, but there's coming a time when your head will be crushed, Satan, and the venom of sin will be done away with through my own flesh and blood, Jesus Christ. So here's what I've noticed, is that that venom has lost its effectiveness. But it's the breath. It's the breath. You see, Satan, make no mistake, he still comes in the form of a serpent. But it's more like a boa, boa constrictor. He just, he just squeezes up close to us. 
little temptations, little whispers here and there, little attitudes that, that He can begin to, to, to flick into our lives. And He begins to get closer to us and He begins to wrap around us like a, like a gentle hug of comfort. Hey, hey, I, I'm here for you in this moment. It just, just try it. Just try me out. And so we, we begin to tiptoe with the serpent kind of wrapped around us. But the only problem is, is that, that when it comes to a boa constrictor, it begins to get tighter and tighter and tighter around our lives. And man, I'm telling you that, that Satan, if he can rob us from the breath, then we're never truly living we are never truly free we are still the apple of God's eye but we are suffocating do you realize that that Jesus didn't just come to take the venom out of sin but when he crushed the serpent he crushed he crushed every type of snake that's trying to come against our life I'm telling you I'm telling you sin has no place in our lives now here's the part of creation that I try to reconcile my mind to it's this that the Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God so in the beginning on day number three, when, when vegetation was created, because God, God sees, He exists outside of time. Jesus is the Word made flesh, and it was the Word that created the world. Because we are the apple of God's eye, because he emphatically loves us beyond our fault, beyond our sin. Jesus looked down throughout the years and he must have seen, I am going to die for this creation. I am going to die for sin that does not belong to me. But for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. What are you saying? I'm saying that on day number three, when he created the very tree that he would die on, day number six was already on his mind. And he said, gosh, I, I, I can't imagine. I'm creating my instrument of death, but these people, this creation, humanity, they're worth it. They are worth it. You are worth it. And he created the trees that he would eventually die upon for each and every single one of us. With every head bowed and every eye closed. You might be in here and you might be wrestling with this thing called sin. Maybe you've never given your life for the one who gave his life for you. But, but you know, you know in this moment that God's Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart. And you know you need Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you to do something that's very brave, that's very courageous. Maybe the boldest thing that you've ever done in your life. But I'm going to ask you today to lift up your hands on the count of three if you need Jesus Christ in your life and you know it. In this moment, we're not going to hesitate, we're not going to delay. On the count of three, if you want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, I want you to lift your hand high in the air. One, two, three. I see that hand, that hand, that hand, that hand. Hands going up all over this place. Hands going up all over this place. Keep those hands high. Now I want you to understand that as your hands are lifted, it is not a prayer that saves you. It is a heart change. It is repentance. It is acknowledging that Jesus Christ is Lord. So I want you to say this prayer with me, but not just the words of the prayer, but the heart of the prayer. Say, Dear Jesus, this morning I recognize that I need you 
Come into my life. Make me new. Forgive my sin. Jesus, you are Lord. I am changed. I am restored. I am redeemed. In the mighty, matchless name of Jesus, I give my life to you. Amen and amen. If you said that prayer and you meant it from your heart, welcome to the family of God. You are amazing. Wow. North Bend, thank you so much. You're absolutely beautiful. All right, let's give it up for Pastor Chris.